and welcome to Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. It's great to have you join us for a conversation with two changemakers working to accelerate the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Innovation is hard, and making a new sustainable material often requires the inventor to prove its utility before companies will embrace it. Today's conversation is about a story of discovery and finding a practical application to prove the value of a plant-based compostable bioplastic foam. Stephen Mayfield, a professor of biology at the University of California, San Diego, and also leader of the California Center for Algae Biotechnology, invented Sole. It's an algae-based rubbery foam. It's a material that can be used in footwear, surfboards, flip-flops, and other products instead of petroleum-based polyurethane foam. Steve launched Algenesis, a biotechnology-based material science company, to co commercialize Soleic. But shoe companies didn't come running to use Soleic, which bio biodegrades completely in seawater and home compost piles. So what could he do? Steve hired Tom Cook, a footwear and apparel industry veteran who had worked for reefs and vans in the past. As an executive there, he had learned how to take these new ideas to market, and together they launched Blue View Footwear, a maker of the world's first compostable shoe. Steve and Tom join me today to talk about the evolution of Algenesis and Blue View Footwear, as well as the many materials that Soleic could replace across a variety of product categories. You can learn more about Blue View Footwear at blueviewfootwear.com. All one word, no space, no dash, blueviewfootwear.com, and its parent company, Algenesis Materials, at algenesismaterials.com. And again, all one word, no space, no dash, algenesismaterials.com. Let's jump into the conversation. Welcome to the show, Steve and Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, pleasure to be here, Mitch. Thanks well, that was Steve. So we're identifying voices. Tom, say hi. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you. So I, I want to start off, I, I understand your origin story begins on the beach, where you were thinking about making a more sustainable surfboard. Tell us, Steve, that story and how Soleic is made. What, what, what got you here? Yeah, it, it actually wasn't the surfboard that was the real epiphany moment for me. I was on a surf trip at the time mm -hmm. in the Maldives, which are a small little set of islands uh, south of India, 700 miles and 1,000 miles off the coast of Africa. And it was a bucket list trip for me as a as a lifelong 55 year surfer. Now um, it was just always been on my bucket list, and I finally got the opportunity to go there in 2018. And uh, the last day of the trip, the captain came to us and said, "Hey, you guys, you know, is there anything you wanted to do on the last day you haven't done yet?" And we've been, you know, fishing and diving and surfing and just beautiful. It's a beautiful set of islands down there, right? And I said, "Hey." And I sort of said it as a joke, but I said, hey, take us to a take us to an island no one's been to before, because these are archipelagos. There's thousands of little islands. And he said, well, I don't know if no one's ever been there before now, but I'll take you to one I bet no one's set foot on in 50 years. How about that? We're like, cool. And we went, we were on the very southern part of it. So we went about 12 miles south, almost down to the equator mm -hmm. in the Indian Ocean and came to this beautiful little island, maybe two acres, just sitting by itself, literally in the middle of nowhere and pulled up and anchored the boat. And we got the little dinghy and went on the beach to sort of have breakfast there, you know, have coffee and walk around. And we walked around to the windward side of the island and it was covered in water bottles and dead flip-flops and plastic crap. And I, you know, we, I, I sat down on the beach and said, I cannot believe this is what we have done to this planet, right? That virtually every island in every ocean now if people are not actively you know living on the island and clean up the plastic every day mm -hmm. they can be a foot deep in plastic and that was both depressing for me as well as this is something i can do this is something i can do something about well fortunately you were a biotechnology engineer yep tell us about soleic what's it made of uh, so that is made of, um, so soleic means soul is sun and oleic is oil. So it's made from sun oils, which means oils that come from plants. Uh, we started with algae. Uh, we still work on algae oils because those will ultimately the, be the most sustainably sourced oil on the planet. But we also use non-food plant oils. Uh, you know, things like jatropha, people have heard of that, or castor oil, or 
Mm -hmm. There's a variety of them. We don't use palm oil and we don't use soybean oil, but any other plant oil will work to make our material. And and what can you, what, what, what can you do with it? I, I think that's really what's important about this story because you had to prove the application. Yeah, I I mean, sort of at a high level, petroleum comes from algae. That's what it is. It's ancient fossil algae. It's not melted dinosaurs. It's not geological formation. It's just algae oil that has sat around for several hundred million years. And obviously, plastics come from petroleum. So we simply said, yeah, let's make plastics directly from algae, directly from plant oils. But let's make them in the new way. So rather than make you know, petroleum, direct petroleum replacements, in other words, plastics that are going to sit around for 500 or 1,000 years, mm-hmm. let's make plastics that will biodegrade in a time that's proportional to the life of the product, right? So our problem is that we make plastics that we will use one time, you know, if it's food packaging or something like that, and then they're going to sit around for 1,000 years in a landfill or worse than that, end up in the ocean or, you know, is in... It's trash someplace, right? So we said, let's make plastics that will biodegrade. Plants aren't a problem. I, you don't, I don't hear anybody saying, oh, there's a giant ocean gyres full of palm trees. And I right? know because they biodegrade. So we mm-hmm. said, let's make a polymer that biodegrades. Now, that was our first thought. And we actually achieved that within about a year. We had nice polyurethanes that could biodegrade. Then developing those to be state-of-the-art specification for things like running shoes or surfboards, that process took us, well, continues on now. We, we make improvements on it every year, but it took us a good four years to meet the specification for a running shoe. Now, I read that it's 52% bio-based material. What's the other 48%? And, and when it degrades, is there any inorganic or harmful res- residual material left? Yeah, super good questions. People are always curious about that. So our products now are anywhere between 57 and 85% bio content. Mm -hmm. And a polyurethane is a polyol, which is a long hydrocarbon with alcohols on the end. And then those cross-link with an isocyanate. And that's what forms a urethane bond. An alcohol and an isocyanate makes a urethane. We get our isocyanates from petroleum today. Although we have invented a process that we can make bio-based isocyanates. So within the next two years, we will have 100% bio content and 100% biodegradable polyurethanes. The other part of your question is, well, how can you make, how can you take a petroleum component and have Mm -hmm. it biodegradable? All biodegradation cares about is what is the bond Mm -hmm. in that material? They don't care if it came from a plant. They don't care if it came from petroleum. They just care, is that a bond I recognize in nature? And if it is, I'm going to clip that bond and I'm going to eat the little molecule that comes out of that. So you can take a petroleum isocyanate, link that with a bio-based polyol, that forms a polyurethane bond, and there are enzymes that will degrade that urethane bond. Then what you get back out is no longer an isocyanate. It's now called the diamine. That diamine looks to that organism like food. And it eats that as well. So essentially, all of that is reprocessable by nature after the fact. That's exactly right. So we are 100% biodegradable, even though we're not 100% of the carbon coming from a plant. So I was struck by the story that Tom shared when we first talked about this, that several shoe companies expressed early interest that backed off. And so you started BlueView uh, to prove the idea. BlueView makes these amazing biodegradable shoes. But does driving adoption by making a a footwear company actually make you the competition that those companies are afraid of? Not not, not really. I mean, I would would tell tell you like this. um, Startup shoe brands are are tiny in scale compared to the big brands. So they're not really threatened by BlueView. The, The reason that we launched BlueView, as I said before, You know, we were working with one of the world's largest uh, athletic brands, and I won't mention their name, but these large athletic, uh, large brands, whether they're athletic or casual, it doesn't really matter. If they're a big brand, they're very conservative and they move very slow and methodically. They Mm -hmm. have to, they have to research everything. They have to do consumer insights and they have to integrate you into their factory. And then once they've decided that the material is 
something that they would like to adopt, you know, there's, there's more testing and processes that they have to go through. And ultimately they put you on a marketing calendar. And, you know, so Steve comes to me one day and says, Hey, you know what, this partnership we've got, they're, they're telling me it's going to take like five to seven years to get to market. Mm -hmm. And Steve and I just laughed. We're like, well, the planet doesn't have that much time. And so, you know, I said to Steve, look, we can get this out of lab and into a factory in less than two years. Let's just, let's launch our own branded product. It can act as proof of concept. It, it can almost act as a little bit of a, a, a prod to sort of nudge these companies along in their thinking and in their decision-making process. And having sat in the VP of global product chair at Reef and in executive product chairs at Vans, I had, an, I had just an insider view of how the process works mm -hmm. when you're a head of product looking at a potential incoming technology like Steve's. So I sort of knew how the process worked on the inside and I knew we could cut a lot of time off by getting BlueView to market. And, and what we were right, you know, as soon as we launched BlueView in the marketplace, we probably had 20 to 30 brands come to the Algenesis site and say, hey, I saw that you've launched your brand. Congratulations. It seems like the technology is now working. Can we get involved? So it proof, pretty, pretty proof that the innovation works yeah. brings the customers in. That's great. Now, you know, but, I, I, what really caught my attention was your, your seawater biodegradation testing videos, which are amazing because not only does the soil break down, but the, the, the fiber upper does too. And you invented this. It's called plant knit. Mm -hmm. What's it made of and where are you sourcing those plant materials? Uh, are they coming from halfway around the world or can we build, make these things in a more local way? We could definitely make them in a more local way. Our plant knit is 45% hemp, 55% cellulose fiber. It comes from eucalyptus trees. Mm -hmm. but we actually source it out of India uh, because that's we, we manufacture the shoes in Asia. There is very little shoe manufacturing in the United States. Right. Um, that's kind of a skill set that moved out. So you have to look at different places. We looked at China. We looked at Vietnam. We eventually settled on Indonesia. Uh, Tom brought in a uh, guy, Rob Purvey, to help us with that. Rob knew the factories there and allowed us to integrate it in. We actually thought when we started this that we had solved what the bottom unit, right? The polyurethane. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Tom and I are like, great. All we have to do is go out and marry this to a plant based because we had read and, and it was advertised plant, plant based up, shoe uppers. So we bought a couple of these things, brought them in, put them through our biodegradation and found out, well, they're 85% plant and 15% nylon or some other. And, and as the cotton part of them biodegraded, you were left with a fishing net full of nylon underneath it. And so we actually had to go, Tom, you know, unfortunately, we had some early investors that were world shoe dogs and they could help us. Uh, identify the knitting machines. We ended up having to buy our own knitting machines and program them so they could use 100% plant-based fiber to knit our uppers. Otherwise, the, the existing ones, and again, we won't name those brands, but those brands that are out there that tell you that they have plant uppers, 85% plant, 15% nylon or some other non-biodegradable material. And that those skeins of, 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 of fiber are very dangerous for sea life. So it's, it's really important that we recognize that. Again, the, the, the video is impressive. How long does Soleil take to break down in seawater? Uh, in, it, it breaks down the fastest in aerobic conditions. So a compost pile, yeah. it goes the quickest and it goes something like you, can, you cannot recognize it as a shoe after six months and by nine months, you can't find it. So fully degraded in nine months. In the ocean, it goes at about half that speed. Mm -hmm. The reason it goes at half that speed is because the oceans, number one, the air exchange, the oxygen exchange isn't as good in an ocean as it is in a compost pile. But mm -hmm. two, oceans are also missing a couple of key things that organisms need. So one of the things that we work on now is what can we add to our foams to get them to degrade faster in the ocean? And mm -hmm. iron, it turns out, is one of the key minerals that is just missing in the ocean. And so if you put iron into the foam, they actually degrade at a much quicker rate. That's fascinating because that's also a carbon capture solution. Yes. Uh, iron fertilization is something Same. that's being widely studied. Same reason, because 
iron's missing. If you throw iron in, you'll get an algae bloom out in the ocean and that captures carbon and sinks down. Now you mentioned composting. Does that apply in home composting or do you need yeah. an industrial composting? Facility? No, home composting. We specifically designed these guys and, and uh, why we were doing what's called the formulation, right? Which is all the other things you add to them right, uh, to, to make them the high performance. We made certain that those broke down in a home compost pile. Industrial okay. composting is the same process, but it has to go at 60 degrees centigrade right. instead of 37 or 40. Well, I'm going to test that at home. I'm, I've got a pair of shoes coming. So okay. I, I mean, the problem is I'm going to, I don't want to just throw them away, but I'll test it. Well, w uh, wear them out first, yeah. you know. Well, that might take a while. <laughs> <laughs> now, looking at the full life cycle of the shoes, and I know that you haven't finalized all of this, but how generally does the carbon impact of making a pair of blue views compare with a traditionally manufactured shoe? So I'll answer on the material side, and I'll let Tom mm -hmm. answer on the, the manufacturing side. Mm -hmm. So on the material side, we get about a 60% reduction in the carbon mm -hmm. for our shoes compared to what you'd get out of a petroleum shoe. Um, that's for the bottom. Uh, for the uppers, because they're plant-based, it's actually a little better. Uh, it's mm -hmm. more like an 80% reduction, I think, if you go to, to cotton fibers or, or cellulose fibers compared to petroleum. And then the manufacturing process, uh, and I'll, I'll to Tom Sorn and then I'll let him answer this. The reason we have a knit upper instead of a cut and sewn upper is because that also has about a 20% reduction in the material. Because believe it or not, every one of those shoes that are the sort of cheaper uh, mm -hmm. cut and sewn version, there's about a 20% waste on that, just the way the patterns fit yeah. into it. Whereas if you knit it, 100% of the thread goes into the knit upper, and then you just clip the thread at the end and start a new one. And then Tom, you can talk about the other parts of the manufacturing process. Yeah, there was, I think it was like two years ago, that MIT did an LCA analysis on one of the big sport running shoe companies. And the way that the carbon footprint of a shoe breaks down is it's like, 45% materials, 45% um, manufacturing uh, related to the energy to run the plant and machinery. And then like, you know, like less than 10% is all the transportation. You know, a lot of people think, oh, it's it's coming, you know, from Asia to America. And that, that's so efficient on those big boats on the, on the ocean. So anyway, that's sort of the DNA makeup of the carbon footprint of a shoe. We're still going to need to get our LCA completed later this summer to understand the manufacturing side of it. Steve's okay. already sort of answered the material estimate because he has a really great feel for the science of the material. So, you know, this summer, later this summer or early fall, we'll know exactly sort of what the carbon reduction is for a pair of Blue View shoes in terms of CO2, kilograms of CO2, right? And, and you see like the work that sort of the all birds and the adidases of the world are doing that there's this sort of drive toward um, decarbonization and physical products. So there's definitely, it's, it's a simple number that sure. consumers can sort of understand. Well, and I, I really look forward to seeing that because I think it'll be yeah. impressive. So yeah. Steve, thinking back to the island, you mentioned flip-flops. What are some of the other applications for Soleic that would eliminate the problem that you ran into in 2018? Yeah, pe people ask this all the time. How many different products can we make? One of the cool things about building Blueview as a company and having Tom there is, is Tom is a designer, right? So Tom is always thinking about, hey, what's the next coolest thing I can add to my shoe? So one of the ones that he challenged us on was, hey, you guys, we have a really nice knit shoe, which is good for summer, but that's not a good winter shoe. Right. If we want a winter shoe, we have to have waterproofing. Right. You guys need to come up with a way that we can waterproof our shoe. So we looked around and we said, OK, polyurethanes are actually used to coat fabrics. In fact, you can make raincoats out of polyurethane coated on fabric. So we're like, OK, we're going <laughs> to invent that next. So we sat down and looked at it. And it's the same underlying kind of chemistry for what's called mm -hmm. a thermoplastic polyurethane as it is for a thermoset. So shoes are thermoset. You mix an A and a B together and they react, cause a foam to expand. And that's how you make, uh, that's how you make a, a sole of a shoe. The plastic coating is thermoplastic polyurethane. So we simply went and invented that as well. And uh, so we, we, we invented that. 
I literally just started calling companies that did fabric coating with polyurethanes because we didn't have that technology. E emailed a bunch of them and several of them emailed right back and said, we're super interested in becoming more yeah. sustainable and bio-based. Send us some of your material. So we did. And it took us several iterations. You know, the normal development cycle goes, you send them something and they go, well, kind of like one of our coatings, but not quite. Here's where it's wrong. Here's where it's good. Here's where it's wrong. We take that back in the lab. We rejigger the chemistry and make a new one and send it to them. And after about three or four cycles, we sent them uh, thermoplastic polyurethane and they sent us back beautifully coated fabric that looked exactly like a raincoat. And so we're like, okay, now we have a new material, biodegradable, that we can do coated fabric with. And that's opened up a whole new industry for us. Wow. Right? Yeah. So now we can make raincoats, we yep. can make uh, breathable rainwear, we can make flickers for fishing people, all kinds of stuff. This is an exciting conversation. I need to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back to continue the conversation. And we are back to continue talking with Steve Mayfield and Tom Cook. They lead the material science company Algenesis and footwear maker Blueview, which makes a completely biodegradable shoe, as we've been talking about. So let me let me change the, the the scope of the conversation a bit. Algae oil is a really intriguing idea, since of course it's it's the unaged version of petroleum. Is this going to be something that you know represents a gold rush where people are going to want to make a lot more products out of algae oil? And do you see that as a core part of Algenesis's business going forward? Yeah, the way we initially started, we were funded by the Department of Energy to do basic research on biofuels. Mm -hmm. And then we elected that, you know, fuels are the lowest value commodity on the planet. So we simply looked around and said, well, we're never going to make biofuels because we can make all these other way more valuable things. I mean, one of them, anyone who's eating omega-3 fatty acids today, very likely those are coming from algae. Right. That has now become the number one source. There aren't enough fish left in the ocean for us to go squeeze fish oil out of them. So we now farm algae for that. And we actually buy the waste stream. So when you make, when you grow algae for omega-3 fatty acids, you have a waste stream of smaller fatty acids and we buy those, right? But that's still a limited supply, 20 to 30 tons per year. Mm -hmm. So we use those for specialty products like our coated fabric. We're making that out of algae oil. But we also designed the entire system so that we could take any plant oil. And the reason we did that is simply because plant oils are grown worldwide right now. And many of them are already commodity chemicals, castor oil, jatropha. I mean, palm oil and soybean oil we could also use, but we don't because we don't want to compete for food. But there sure. are millions of tons of sort of commodity oils made from plants worldwide. And we wanted to scale this technology as fast as we can. Having said that, algae will become the future feedstock that we use. We hope there is a gold rush. Our plan is we buy as much algae oil as the algae farmers can produce. We are not algae farmers ourselves, okay. and we will never get into that business. We will let people who are better at that grow the algae, and we will simply buy the oils from them. But what we hope is, as we introduce these products and consumers accept them and start to buy more, that's the pull side. And they will start to grow more of this because from a greenhouse gas perspective, it is the absolute best thing you can do. Algae are 10 to 20 times more efficient than soybean at producing oil. So what's involved in scaling up algae growing and how much space, whether that's on land or on the oceans, are we going to need to displace fossil fuels as a, as a feedstock for plastics? Yeah, when people were doing the calculations on what we would need for fuel, the idea was that we were going to need hundreds of square miles or even thousands of square miles. But chemicals are a fraction of fuel. So to actually replace all the chemicals, you know, we're not talking about taking half of the United States to do this, right? We're talking about it would be hundreds of thousands of acres, probably even the low millions of acres. But just to put that in perspective, we grow 100 million acres of corn and 60 million acres of soybean in the United States every year. 
Now, the reason algae becomes super interesting and the reason that the Biden administration right now is sort of pushing for this new agriculture is because you can grow algae with non-potable water. You can grow it in ocean water if you need to. We have lots of that and we have lots of land that is flat, perfectly good for algae ponds that we cannot do agriculture on now. So this is really the new agriculture. Now, these guys won't be growing algae just for us. They'll be growing algae for protein content, for carbohydrates, and then we'll take the oil fraction of them to make our shoes. Strikes me that this is also an opportunity for the global south to use a lot of currently unused land in productive but non-environmentally harmful ways. That's exactly right. So, wow. Okay, so we're also addressing the social justice issues associated with the transition to decarbonization. I Really fascinating. So looking at how you have spun out Blueview as a separate company, Tom, you're a designer. You must be thinking about all sorts of different points of entry to the market. Do you create more companies? Does Blueview grow into a clothing manufacturer? I mean, per the, uh, the conversation about uh, making a raincoat earlier. What do you, what's, what's, it, what's the, the roadmap look like? Great question. You know, for me, Blueview has become this really interesting proof of concept vehicle. And, and I think we get to choose the projects we think are most meaningful to establish that confidence that the technology is viable and real. We're not sure we're going to need to do it on every material mm -hmm. tech, though. We've talked a lot about the fabrics, and because of how quickly they're working and, and how much interest there is from the markets, Blueview might not have to make a raincoat. Um, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't continue to push the envelope and ask for new technologies. Like, you know, Steve gave you the example of what led to the coated fabrics. Sure. And our intent was, hey, look, we can get this into a winterized shoe, but we knew all along that would have applications to apparel and accessories. So we're trying to we're trying to use Blueview as a speedboat mm -hmm. to get to new technologies much, much faster than if we had to wait um, for other companies to sort of adopt and help us do that R and D work, and and we're we're quite good at now just sprinting in Asia to get these these things done. So you know there there's there's several things in the roadmap um, that I'm really excited about. Steve hinted at one of them earlier. Um, I'll I'll give you two or three in terms of the sort of futures material technologies that Blueview could adopt or that we could we could adopt straight into other brands. So I'm really excited about what the TPU can unlock. So the TPU can lead to essentially biodegradable Gore-Tex, what's called 1010 mm -hmm. fabrics that are waterproof breathable. And mm -hmm. Steve has also sort of um, already proved that in lab. You know, he, he sent me a text the other morning. Hey man, you know, we got, we got waterproof breathable with the head explosion emoji. And I'm like, <laughs> awesome. And then, um, you know, I get texts like that from Steve and Mike Burkhardt all the time. It's like, oh, my God, these guys are sprinting. I thought it was going to take years to do this stuff. And it's like months. It's already kind of being birthed in lab. So it's still that, you know, process to get it out of lab and into factories. But mm -hmm. so that's one thing I'm really excited about is the, the potential of the TPUs in different fabric applications. So you got waterproof breathable. The other thing I'm really excited about to stick with the TPUs is it, there's kind of two branches. The TPUs lead us into footwear applications, which are really interesting, like TPU sort of outsoles made from a flexible TPU, but they mm -hmm. can also lead to what's called eTPU, which is essentially ex expanded thermoplastic polyurethane foam. And that stuff gets really interesting because that's the elite uh, high-performance running shoe right. that sole foams. So that, that could open up a whole athletic midsole market for us. And then, you know, kind of on the other side, um, the, the continued application of the coatings, the TPU coatings right. can lead to alternative leathers. So we have some of the luxury brands now approaching us about, hey, you know what? They, they employ PhD material scientists now, and those folks are tapping on the door saying, guys, look over there. Algenesis has got biodegradable TPU coatings, high bio content great performance, this could bring down the cost of the alternative leathers, which is super exciting to us. That's interesting to me. I was 
thinking about boots because I tend to wear boots yeah. when I hike and uh, uh, rather than a, than a fabric. And so really looking forward to seeing that. So in general, how would you describe the shoe business's progress to date? Is it is it explosive or it does it ever become a distraction to Al Genesis's business? I'll be I'll be honest on the first question. It has not been explosive because the economy for shoes right now is really difficult. And it takes time to understand what the perfect marketing mix is going to be, the product, the price, the placement, the promotion. We've had a lot of learnings there. Um, We're about to get more aggressive in terms of blue view sales. We're going to make a retail price drop. We think it's the right thing to do for the planet. But it's also the right thing to do to make the shoe just more accessible to everyone from a price point perspective. So we intend to drop the price from 120 retail to 80 retail. And we think that's going to do wonderful things for the conversion rate of the shoe. Yeah. And Steve and I are getting really clever about how do we get some growth hacks for Blueview where we're not basically just making Google and Meta rich with these paid social ads, which we are, we've chosen not to do that anymore. We're just We're just going to look at things like celebrity and influencer seeding and see if we can kind of get a lucky virality event that way. I also, I mean, I want to get Steve on stage more. Like we're, we're going to try to get him on the virtual stage at the Earth Day Initiative event in New York that reaches like one and a half million people and goes to a huge email list. So we're looking at kind of cool things like that, that are like dead center bullseye for people who care about the planet, who would really be interested in this show. Um, I would tell you this, Steve and I are are 90% focused on selling the Soleic technology to third-party brands. We are 10% focused on, you know, Blueview, maybe, you know, could it become the next Allbirds? Maybe, but we don't need it to, you know, we just need to sell the material technology to Allbirds and Adidas and Nike eventually, and all the big apparel brands, you know, Patagonia, North Face, Arctera, whoever those folks may be. And, And that's what really, that's the big vision. We always say this quote, and I think we all we all have said it at times. The small victory is we sell a lot of Blue View products. The big victory yeah. is we literally transform industries and clean up material supply chains. You know, if you look at fashion, you can go on the internet and you can read a report that says it's anywhere from the fourth to the tenth most polluting industry on the planet. Right? Mm-hmm. Fashion is made up of footwear, apparel, and accessories. You know, it could be the big sports companies. It could be the luxury fashion companies. It could be just a casual company, but it's it's a filthy, dirty industry. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to join Steve. I had to get out of that. I mean, we're just continuing to pollute and consume, and and I wanted to be a part of the solution and and stop being a part of the problem. Yeah, and you know the thing about all that fashion is that when you're done with it, it just goes into the landfill and just sits there. And and yeah. that transformation, the idea that I could put it in my my compost pile or, or even in, in my home electric compost is really compelling to me. And, and that's the beginning of true circularity, not necessarily all going back into new material, but at least back into the earth in a healthy way. That's right. Yep. Nature can digest this waste. And that's, that's a first. So our listeners are going to want to know more about Blueview. How can they do, do that? Yeah. So they can log on right now to blueviewfootwear.com. Um, Maybe wait until next week when we've initiated our price change so that you can get a better deal. But if you want to... Well, this, this will come out next week when you have. Perfect. So that's that's amazing. So yeah, log on to the website. It's blueviewfootwear.com. Steve and I always say that the quickest and easiest way to make an impact through our company is buy a pair of shoes from us. It's one less toxic forever petroleum shoe out there, period. And Steve, how can... A manufacturer interested in talking with you, contact El Genesis to begin the conversation. Yeah, it's, you know, I, so we have the same website. It's algenesis. algenesismaterials.com. Um, pretty easy to find. If you, if you also Google my name, uh, you are, yeah. we're not hidden. Uh, you, you will find us on the internet pretty damn quick. We'd love to talk to manufacturers. Happy to start the discussions on how we can get insoles or cup soles into your shoes how we can get coated fabric into your product or some other injectable uh, TPU application that you have. As Tom pointed out, there are hundreds of those. And uh, we're we're actively and aggressively courting big brands, little brands. Little brands tend to move quicker. 
Perfect for us as a mid-sized brand. If you're selling 50 to 100 million bucks worth of products, we're your guys. Come on over here and we'll integrate that material into your system really quickly. Well, Steve and Tom, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Oh, thank, thank you, you Mitch. Mitch. Pleasure. We've been speaking with Steve Mayfield, the University of California, San Diego professor who invented Soleil and launched Algenesis, a material science company. And Tom Cook, who's president at Algenesis and leader of the biodegradable shoemaker, Blue View Footwear. Wow, folks, that was a game-changing conversation in my mind. Uh, we heard a clear and achievable path to 100% plant-based plastics and fabric production that can be applied to footwear, outerwear, clothing, and in other product categories, as well as a vision for sustainable, carbon-lowering algae oil farming that can bring new incomes to the emerging economies in the global south where climate change is hitting people hardest. I'm struck that once again, too, following other guests' comments, we heard a company describe having entered a sustainable business to produce biofuels, but then recognized a larger business opportunity in making materials and feedstock for an environmentally responsible modern company. The gears of industry, no, wait, no, strike that. The evolutionary process of reinvention of industry are turning. Real alternatives to fossil fuel-based products from fuels that will be cheaper than oil to clothing and footwear that biodegrades without leaving residual toxins in the environment are breaking out everywhere. Now we need to connect these choices to the world's consumers who have already made clear they want to spend to end the global warming and environmental destruction. So if you're shopping for shoes, check out Blueview at blueviewfootwear.com. Blueview footwear is all one word, no space, no dash. And hopefully, Pretty soon, a dozen other shoemakers will be using Algenesis's soleic and plant knit fabrics as well. I hope you'll take a few minutes to share this show or any of the more than 370 episodes of sustainability in your ear with your friends, family, coworkers, the people that you buy shoes and clothes from. Tell them that you want to change and share this show with them. And if you take a minute to write a review, that will really help others find us as well. You folks are the amplifiers that spread the ideas that lead to a less wasteful world. Let folks know that we can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any of the other fine purveyors of podcast goodness. I will really appreciate your support. Thank you. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. We'll be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. Bye.